21-year-old Therese Stinson woke up in the middle of a grassy area, not knowing where she was. She soon realized that her son, Jordan, who had been with her earlier, was gone. There had been a man in a white Toyota who had offered them a ride home. She started to remember he had punched her, dumped her out of the car, and now he had taken Jordan. Who was this man and where was little Jordan? Hello there and welcome, or welcome back, to A Wicked World. Today's case is one that happened back in 2018 in Largo, Florida. When this case happened, I actually lived only a few miles down the street from where it happened. So I was part of the Largo community that was keeping their eye out for this white Camry and that was following up on all the updates on this case, hoping that somebody would find little Jordan and alive. I don't know if this needs to be said, but again, this is another child case, so please do know that before you proceed any further into the video. This is the story of little Jordan Beliveau. Jordan Beliveau was a very curious, but somewhat laid back toddler. He was always so happy and full of smiles. His foster family actually called him Mr. Chuckles because he was such a happy little boy. Jordan was born on July 31st, 2016 to his parents, Cherise Stinson, and Jordan Beliveau Sr. in Largo, Florida. And for those of you who don't know, Largo, Florida is very close to St. Petersburg and about half hour, 45 minutes from Tampa. So from the time that little Jordan was only three months old, his life was not easy. His dad was a known gang member and when he was only three months old, his dad was shot twice, once in the driveway of the home where they were living and then another time a little further on down the street. They also learned that Jordan Sr. had threatened a woman with a gun earlier on in the night. There had also been prior calls to the house before Jordan was born. There was calls because there were stolen pills, a homicide suspect at the house at one point. He had been living in a very dangerous environment with drug dealers, gang members, and there was also a sex offender hanging around. Well, needless to say, Child Protective Services was called. At this point, Jordan was taken away from his parents and he was placed into foster care. Jordan got placed with the best foster parents any kid in the foster care system could ask for, the Warrens. They loved him like he was their own child. They were actually trying to adopt Jordan. His foster parents had custody of him from the time that he was five months old until May of 2018. There was a time when Cherise had an unsupervised visit with little Jordan and she brought him to Burger King. There was a fight going on between two other girls. She intervened while she was holding little Jordan, trying to stop the fight, and the other girl swung and accidentally hit little Jordan in the lip. So this clearly was still not a good environment for him. However, like I said, come May 2018, he was taken out of foster care and he was reunited with his parents. This happens way too often that they're taken out of a loving home and reunited with their parents who don't care about them at all. And it's like, how do social workers not see that? Those who have been doing it for so long can't tell the difference. Maybe you shouldn't be doing that job. I don't know. Sam and Juliet Warren already felt like Jordan was their own child. They had watched all his milestones from him sitting up for the first time to him crawling. They had raised him. So when he was taken away and given back to his parents, you can imagine how terrible they felt. The court said that they believed that the conditions that had caused Jordan to be removed from his house in the first place had been corrected. So that is why they felt like it was proper to reunite him with his parents. However, Cherise still had not been to counseling like she was supposed to. She had actually asked to go to counseling and nobody followed through with her, never set it up. Jordan was still released back into her custody. The court said that they believed the child's return to the mother would not be detrimental to his health or well-being. It's also confirmed that the judge was unaware of a domestic violence dispute where Jordan Sr. was accused of punching Charisse. This actually happened July 15th, just one day before the judge signed off on a custody change approval. 
Yeah, Governor Ron DeSantis says that uh, those that are responsible will be held accountable and that he fully supports DCF in their full review of the foster care system in Pinellas County. Now that report that was released yesterday shows that the two agencies that were in charge of Jordan Bellevue's case ignored concerns about his mother, Sharice Stinson, like possible drug use, domestic violence and missed appointments. DCF says they also didn't check in on Jordan weekly like they should have and never put down uh, anger management classes on Stinson's case plan, even after she asked for them. In September, both agencies defended their actions in getting Stinson custody of her son. Both agencies say they are making changes to ensure what happened to Jordan never happens again. Like I said before, why child services would ever take him out of this loving home and put him back with Sharice when she hadn't even done everything that she was supposed to do to begin with. It makes no sense. And how were you not aware of the domestic violence dispute? It's your job to know that this happened before you return the child to this mother's care. Hello? He was happy, healthy, and well taken care of at the Warren's house. And that was all ripped away from poor little Jordan. And he didn't deserve that. On September 4th, 2018, Charisse and Jordan were walking along East Bay Drive in Largo, Florida, when a man stopped and asked them if they needed a ride home. Charisse accepted because she said that little Jordan was getting very heavy and it was a long ways until she got back to her apartment. Now this was around 9.30 at night and she said that the man's name was Antoine. Her and Antoine had a disagreement. He ended up punching her in the face which knocked her out unconscious. Hours later she says she woke up in Largo Park and Jordan was nowhere to be found. She assumed that the driver Antoine had taken him but she didn't know where to start looking. So she went to the police and filed a missing persons report, which sent out an Amber Alert. So everybody was on the lookout for him. There was billboards on the highways that were saying, look out for the white Toyota Camry. And this went on for a couple days. Wooded areas, ponds, lakes. There's tons of marshy, swampy area in Florida. They were searching everywhere that they could, but to cover all of that ground is going to take a long time. Two days in, they had not found anything. They had, however, gone to search Sharisha's apartment to see if they found anything there. They did find some bloody clothes, but they were not sure if it related to Jordan's disappearance because Sharice told them that he had actually had stitches in his chin recently, and that's what the blood was from. And that was confirmed to be true, that he did have stitches in his chin recently. So after 60 hours of searching, little Jordan was finally found. Unfortunately, it was not alive. He was found near the Largo Sports Complex in a wooded area by the baseball fields. He had just been dumped there like he was nothing, just left behind and forgotten. The community was devastated. Everybody was so upset because we had gotten so invested in little Jordan and hearing about how sweet of a boy he was and looking at his adorable face and being worried about him. So it was a devastating loss for everybody when his body was found. Sharice was taken into custody. Everybody soon learned that her claims of Anton and the white Toyota Camry was all false. She had set off this Amber Alert and none of it was true. She had done this to little Jordan. Apparently, Charisse had lost her temper and she smacked Jordan in the face, which caused him to fall backwards and hit his head hard on the wall. From there, he started to have seizures throughout the night. She didn't know what to do. She didn't bring him to the hospital. She didn't call 911. She let it happen. And eventually he succumbed to it and he died from blunt force trauma. So she wrapped him up in a blanket and she brought him to this wooded area by the baseball fields and she left him there. Not only that, she then gave herself a head injury so that she could have this fake story to back it all up and make it look like it wasn't her. The medical examiner found out that two-year-old Jordan had a fracture in his skull with hemorrhaging underneath it. Plus, he had cuts to his lips and left thigh, as well as a broken thigh bone. Charisse was charged with first-degree murder, and she was also pregnant with another child at the time of her arrest. Charisse's trial was October of 2020, and after accepting a plea deal, her charges were lessened, and she was charged with second-degree murder. However, she was still sentenced to 50 years in prison. She also was ordered to pay a $28,000 fine to the city of Largo 
for the cost of the false Amber Alert that she had started. As it had been a few years later, Sharice made this statement in court. It is a long time, but I will walk with my head held high. I apologize for the pain I have caused. I'm not the same person. I was angry and bitter, but now I'm free mentally. I'm not held in bondage anymore, and that is the greatest gift that God has given me. And I thank my son for that because I was lost for a long time. And I guess as awful as the situation is, that's the best outcome that you could hope for. She's got time in prison, and she realizes what she did was wrong. There was also a candlelit vigil held for Jordan in Largo. Not only that, but tons and tons of stuffed animals, flowers, balloons, and a giant white cross with his name on it were placed near where they had found the little boy. In February of 2020, Governor DeSantis signed a bill named after Jordan, Jordan's Law. It reduces the workload for caseworkers, meaning that their maximum caseload would be no more than 15 kids, so now they can concentrate on each child more. Before, they had way too many. I don't know how many they were taking on, but it was clearly too many. 15 at a time is already a lot. That's sad that there's that many children being abused or neglected. Jordan's foster family, the Warrens, were actually able to foster his new baby sister. The little girl's name is Serenity, which I think is just great. I love that for them. They were so attached to little Jordan and so broken when he died, and now it's like they got a little piece of him, his little baby sister, and they have actively been working towards adopting her. I haven't heard anything on the situation negative, so I assume everything has gone through positively for the Warrens, and I really do hope so. Jordan died a completely unnecessary death. Sharice should have gotten him the medical attention he needed. She wouldn't be in prison as long. Jordan would be alive. She didn't think of that. She didn't know what to do. She was stupid, angry, and a bad mother. Children's Services should have seen that she was not capable, and they never should have given Jordan back. He was so well taken care of before, and now look where he is, just three months after he was given back to his mother. It's terrible. Thank you for listening to Jordan's entire story. If you like true crime, don't forget to subscribe below, and check back often because I'll be uploading at least one new case every week. Thanks for watching A Wicked World. Bye.